Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading With Your Kids podcast, coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We hope that you subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Himalaya, Player FM, wherever you find your podcast. We have two wonderful guests for you today, our feature guest is Daniel Jude Miller. He is the author of Monsters in Manhattan. We'll also be having a quick chat with our friend Faith Goldstein when we met up with her in the Chicago Toy and Games Fair. Speaking of Chicago and having a great time in Chicago, we want to invite you to join us at the Kids Expo February 8th and 9th. The Kids Expo happening at the Schaumburg Convention Center in Schaumburg, Illinois. We are so excited. The Reading With Your Kids podcast will be having a totally interactive booth where families can experience what it's like to be a guest on the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We'll also be presenting two amazing magic shows at the fair, both on Saturday and Sunday. Be sure to check it out. It's Kids Expo February 8th and 9th, Schaumburg Convention Center, Schaumburg, Illinois. Joining us on the line right now from Binghamton in the central part of New York State. I'm really excited. Our author, our guest today is an author. He's an illustrator. He's a graphic designer. He's a publisher. He's a little bit of everything. He's a really great guy. Please welcome to the show, Daniel Jude Miller. Daniel, how are you? I'm great. That that was the most energetic uh, introduction I think I've ever gotten. So thank you very much. <laughs> very welcome. <laughs> I don't know if my energy is always welcome, but you know we 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 were we're thankful thankful that at, at this age, as I approach a hundred years old, I can still find <laughs> the energy to get up in the morning and to do the podcast. So I'm really excited to find out about monsters in Manhattan. I'm looking at the artwork, and it is fascinating and fun. And I can't wait for you to tell us about the story. Uh, yeah, I mean it's 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 I go do a lot of school visits, and I always tell kids about little ideas that turn out to become monstrous projects. And that's what Monsters in Manhattan uh, was. It was a little, little tiny idea that I had a long, long time ago that just kept growing and growing and growing and is is still growing. It's actually only halfway uh, realized. There's still um, a lot more to come, a lot more. Well, that is really exciting. Um, now, the mo- as, as someone who's... Um grew up in Boston and, and had mm-hmm. visits to Manhattan is actually robbed in Manhattan one time. Oh, no. <laughs> but just like everybody else. Um, <laughs> no, I've never been robbed. I lived there 30 years, never robbed. Oh, good. Well, you know, I was like that yokel coming in from the countryside, I guess. But, uh, you, you know, the, the who are the monsters that we're going to meet in Monsters in Manhattan? Well, the, when I said I got the idea a long time ago, it started real simple. I used to work in the Empire State Building I was an editorial illustrator doing really, really boring drawings. And one day I was walking home and I passed a manhole, you know, those holes in the street that go down into the sewer. And sometimes in New York City in the winter, steam will come out of them. Sometimes you see that in the movies. And it made me think it looked like a dragon, like lived underneath the city streets. And that that gave me an idea. At the time, I wasn't a writer, and I didn't plan on doing anything with books. But that idea of this dragon is what started the whole thing. So from there, there became a dragon that lived under the streets and ghosts that live in the Empire State Building and a gargoyle and a, a mad scientist in Central Park that's creating an army of mutant pigeons and rats, and it goes on and on and on and tours every possible city landmark and has everything from witches to wizards to giants to fairies to anything that you can think of. That is amazing. I think I've run into some of those mutant pigeons, by the way. (laughs) It's funny. I I used to do something where I would ask people their, their best New York stories, and I one of my favorite ones is I saw someone walking down the street, and a pigeon landed in their hair, like not on their head, in their hair, and then couldn't get out. And the person was panicking, and then eventually it flew away. So, yes, it does happen. <laughs> yes, 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 I can see it. I can see it. It's it's amazing. I think people are amazed sometimes at when they go to a big city like New York City or Boston or Chicago, and 
you know, they, they, they meet the quote unquote wildlife there that has absolutely no <laughs> fear of human beings. <laughs> No, 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 none, none whatsoever. It's a, it's a whole bunch of squirrels, pigeons, and I've been lucky. I've only seen like one rat, so okay. I, I've been lucky. <laughs> Either lucky or have your eyes closed. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm just lucky, like, or I don't go out too late at night. But no, I've, I've avoided the rats. <laughs> Well, really, real excited. I love that idea that you were walking down the street, passing a manhole, seeing steam come come up through the manhole, and then that ignited your your imagination to think there might be a dragon living under there. That is so cool, and and I'm thinking how much fun a family can have just you know a, a parent kind of igniting their kids' imagination like that, seeing that and thinking what's causing that steam to come up and yeah it's great to you know get the scientific reason behind it and so the kids mm. you know aren't terrified but it's also fun to to think about that dragon that might be down there well what's funny is that like there's 10 monsters in each book and actually the monsters part one and monsters part two are currently out i'm, I'm working on parts three and parts four now at the same time um each book has 10 monsters and they go to 10 separate new york city locations and the only monster that I actually know the story for of where I was inspired, everyone always asks me, where did you get the idea? The only one I remember is the dragon mm -hmm. because the rest of them, they all kind of just came and they don't really, there's not a whole lot of logic on why there's vampires that eat pizza in little Italy or why there are fairies on the Brooklyn Bridge. For some reason, it just worked. And as I sort of wandered the city and looked for little ways or little hiding places and corners that monsters could live in New York City, it turned out that I found giants and I found an alien. And it turned out that there was there was a lot of different interesting uh, creatures. The fun part for me doing the book was even though I grew up in New York City and I lived there for, for three decades, as a New Yorker, you don't go to a lot of the, the landmarks or a lot of the tourist locations. So I actually had forced myself. I had never been to the Statue of Liberty. I had never been um, to Rockefeller Center, uh, to the top of the Rockefeller Center. So when I was doing the book to make to research it, I actually had to get myself to go to those locations. And then I got to enjoy them for the first time as an adult. So. You know, that is something that. I think everybody who grows up in a big city mm -hmm. is, is guilty of, you know, right. certainly in Boston. We, you know, we went on the field trips as as a kid in school. We, we did a lot of, you know, the Freedom Trail and, and all that right. kind of stuff. But otherwise, you know, we don't hit any of the quote unquote tourist spots un, un, unless we have family visiting and we're taking them, you know, kind of begrudgingly taking them into into the spots. It's true. It's true. It's like I used to I worked for five years in the Empire State Building um, and it's every single day it's surrounded by tourists. But I had only been to the top of the building. I worked on the 65th floor every day. I've only been to the top of the building once. So <laughs> it's just the way it is. So close yet so yeah. far away. But it's free. See, when it, to, to the 65th floor wasn't costing me any. They were paying me to go to the 65th floor. <laughs> so I never had, I only paid once. <laughs> well, I also see, and, and given my recent experience driving back across uh, um, New York State, that there, there's monsters living in the hot dog carts in New York City. Yes, there's a two-headed goblin that lives underneath uh, the hot dog carts, and he has a long, sticky lizard um, tongue that he uses to try to snatch snatch the food away from you. Like the the story of Monsters Manhattan, it started with that dragon, but the real story is it's about it's about a boy who's similar to me. Uh, he's growing up in New York City and he's real excited for winter break. And what happens is his cousin comes to visit for winter break, and that's normally something you would want, like family visiting for the holidays, but not in this case because his cousin Mary Lou from Kalamazoo is a bully. But she's worse than regular bullies because she is a disgusting bully. So she's always picking her nose and putting it on him and burping on him and sticking her fingers in his ears. And it's ruining his whole winter break. So the premise was that he takes her to New York City. He shows her all the tourist attractions, but he also shows her the different monsters that live under the hot dog carts or at the museums. And he hopes that he can scare her away and possibly save his winter break. Very, very cool. That's and, and I love that you kind of um, uh, 
you know, a, a lot of times when we're thinking about kids who are gross and picking their <laughs> nose and everything. It's usually the guys. Interesting that you chose <laughs> his female cousin to kind of be the gross bully. Well, I actually I never thought of that. Actually, that was just what that was the character that came in the first book. Now in the second book, right, it does switch to a male character because she. I don't want to ruin how the first one ends, but let's just say this: that by the second book, it's now summer break, and the main character Mike, he's all ready for uh, his summer vacation. And guess what happens? Her brother Jimbo Joe comes to visit, and he's heard what happened to Mary Lou, and he's here for revenge. So they take him back to the city to try to do the same thing, but only with new locations and hopefully scare him away. So there's actually two bullies. It depends which book you're reading. Uh, this is this is a lot of fun. And uh, boy, what a what a, what a great book to read as a family. You know, I'm imagining that it would be a lot of fun for family just to sit down because it seems like the stories in the in the different parts are, are kind of you know kind of quick reads that if the family can kind of enjoy the illustrations mm-hmm. and and read it quickly like like maybe one you know one and, and right before dinner time or something like that. Right, because each there's a story that runs through each book and through the whole series, but each individual monster has their own page, mm-hmm. and they have their own little story that's that's personal to them. So technically, like you're saying, yes, it can be written, uh, read in parts because each monster is is its own monster, and then at the end, the whole story comes together. Um, so yeah, it's what I also like to always mention is that I've had uh, people that have not been to New York City or children that have not been to New York City that it's a good introduction for them into all of the even though I didn't see them when I was younger. There's an enormous amount of amazing landmarks and history and tourist attractions, which is why, aside from the books, if at the website MonstersInManhattan.com, there's a map of New York City where each monster is plotted on the map and uh, children can click on it or families can click on it and learn more about the monster, which is not in the book, and also fun facts about that specific location. And it actually has the monsters from Monsters in Manhattan Part 3 and Part 4, like a little bit of a preview of them, and those books won't even come out until 2020. Now, has has Mayor de Blasio reached out to you beca- to, you know, make Monsters in Manhattan some kind of official uh, tourist guide? I, he has not. Uh, I, I have, like I said, I've lived in Binghamton now for 15 years, so he wasn't even the mayor at the time when, when I was down there. Uh, they, I, I have been, you know, living there for a while, but yeah, I wish, right? That would be great, some sort of walking tour. We've, we've tried to work on that, like some sort of walking tour where you can go to each location and, and, and find out more about the location and also the imagination of what could possibly live there. Well, I, I imagine if, if some kids are walking around New York City and actually visit a hot, hot dog cart, they'll be surprised <laughs> that the monsters live underneath the cart, not inside the water that the dogs are kind of swimming in. <laughs> yes, yes. There, I, I've lived in New York City. Uh, I lived there for 30 years, and I, I don't think I've ever, unfortunately, had or fortunately <laughs> had a hot dog. I, I don't think that's the one thing. I, I, I can eat pizza all day, and I'll eat it from anywhere. But I don't. I I will not partake in in those hot dogs. I save them for others. <laughs> now you w- your style is is really really fun. Is in in terms of your illustrations. Um, where did you kind of develop that that style? I uh, actually I I grew up drawing like most students do, most kids do. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to be an illustrator. I always knew, and so. I was drawing and practicing and drawing, and then I actually wanted to draw realistic, like once I went to art school. When I started uh, going to the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan, uh, I was going to be a painter. That was my plan. And then there was just one winter break, which is kind of funny because that ties in with the first Monsters in Manhattan where everything changes during winter break. I went home for school, uh, from school and decided I was never going to draw realistically again, and I never have. I became a cartoonist over about a 30-day span. Um, and believe it or not, like I always tell the story because it's important for kids to know and families to know is that when I came back to school and I was only drawing cartoons, a teacher told me to not do that. They said, don't do that. Go back to drawing realistically. You will never make a career out of drawing cartoons. And I'll never forget that. And I 
thought about it and I decided, no, nope, I, I, I want to draw this way. I want to draw like a cartoon style. I want it to be fun and I want to be specifically for kids. And I have made a career out of it. So the point is, it's, 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 it wasn't the plan. Like originally I was supposed to be a different type of artist, but in the end, I enjoy doing it the way I do it now. Now, you, you talked about being a, an illustrator and never thought about mm-hmm. becoming a writer. How challenging was it for you to actually take that leap? It, obviously, it was a challenge for you to go from the realistic style to the cartoon style, uh, but that was kind of already in your wheelhouse. And becoming a, 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 a writer, even though you're telling stories through your artwork, becoming a writer with words is, is different, and that takes, that takes a leap of faith. How did that happen? Well, I, whenever students ask me that, I only, I never took a writing class. I, you know, had done, I literally done 10,000 drawings before I ever wrote one story. I, I never wanted to be a writer. And then in my late twenties, I passed that manhole and that steam coming out and it gave me that idea. And I'm honest with students when I go to schools and they say, why did you write the story yourself? Like, why would you not find a writer? And I say, because it was my story. And I didn't want to share the experience with anyone. So I sat down and I just decided to teach myself uh, how to write a book. And actually, which is even harder, is the Monsters in Manhattan series is written in rhyme. So not only was I learning how to write a story, but I actually had to learn how to essentially become a poet, Mm -hmm. which was the, you know, the challenge was there. Um, I'm going to be honest. It took it took 10 years from the from that idea to the finished book to do that first one. Now the book's take about a year to do but that first one it did take a while to become a writer but because it was definitely a harder challenge than than anything i've ever done but then strangely enough it turns out when you start doing something it gets easier and you get better at it and so over this last summer i actually wrote my first uh, middle grade novel which i never would have thought i would have been able to do or want to do but it turns out the more you do stuff the better you get at it and the faster you get at it how surprising that that what our parents tell us about you know practicing mm-hmm. and and working hard on things actually pays off right and it's and I always tell I tell kids so much it's like the number one thing I want them to understand is is not is practicing but also just trying mm-hmm. because you really never know like what's going to happen like you know there's a, a story I tell all the time I always wanted to be actually a sports logo designer that was my main dream and then I I dropped that in college but when I moved to Binghamton, I went to a hockey game and I didn't like our, our minor league team's logo. So on my own, I just designed it and sent them my idea. And I assumed they were, you know, would throw it out. And that was, that's what I expected. And they didn't. They ended up opening it, buying it. And for five years, uh, my logo was our local, uh, uh, you know, NHL affiliates uh, uh, logo. And I was super proud of that. And I tell kids the reason I was proud is because I liked the drawing, but I also took a chance. And so sometimes it's not even, it's not, you, 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 once you, you can't practice something until you take that first leap and actually just try to do it once. And so then once you're doing it, practice and practice and keep trying. And look, I'm still learning now. You know, that's something that we've talked a lot about here on the podcast and, and in different contexts. And you're absolutely right. Encouraging our kids to take a chance mm-hmm. to risk failure is so important and i think it's something that a lot of parents with with the best intentions because they love their kids they they don't want their kids to get hurt they don't want to, them to experience sadness but failing is such an important experience for all of us it's true and the, and here's the best part creative things right there's really is no failing so there's no risk really at all like the, there's nobody can get hurt and you can't really fail because I tell students all the time. Some, some, I ask how many kids like to read, uh, and most of them usually do. And then I ask them how many like to write and there's always less. And I say, well, why is that? Because you can't get it wrong. Like you can't make a mistake. Nobody can tell you that it's even not good because it's your work and creating is always safe and it's always the cure for everything that I can, you know, I tell kids that don't, uh, kids that are worried, draw. Like kids that are afraid, draw. Like always use that as an outlet. Find a way to be creative because literally you can't fail when you're creating. There's no such thing as failure. Yeah, not, you know, the world might not love it, but it doesn't matter. Right. You love it. Right. It's yours. Right. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. Yes, it's true. 
Now, I know there's a lot of places, even even with four books uh, done and about to come out, that, that there's still a lot of places in New York City and Manhattan f- to discover monsters. But have you ever thought about taking the show on the road and maybe discovering monsters in Milwaukee or monsters in Boston or Los Angeles? That's the number one question I get. So Monsters 3 and 4 are already written, but it takes much longer to do the illustrations than do the writing. So it'll take all of next year to finish those. And I always get asked if there will be a Monsters 5. And the answer, for the most part, is no, only because I've run out of locations in New York City and I've run out of Monsters. So there could be a fifth book, but like you're saying, it would probably be some sort of Monsters Across America sort of uh, travel across the whole country. But the plan is, is after Monsters 4 comes out, there's going to be a Monsters in Manhattan trading card game so that all the monsters would get cards, you'll be able to fight them, and you'll be able to learn things about New York City. So that's what's tentatively planned for the future. That is exciting. Now, you you mentioned that you just wrote your first middle grade novel. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's available to folks, or do we have an anticipated publication date? It should be around April of, of next year, April 2020. And do we have a title yet? Okay, so this is an exclusive because I haven't told anybody. All the only right. people who know this, <laughs> my wife and my son are the only people that have heard these words. So you've heard it here first. Okay, the title of the upcoming middle grade novel will be called The Final Five. Okay, it has nothing to do with monsters because it's a departure for me uh, subject-wise, but it actually is about a boy a 13-year-old boy who loves his cell phone, like most people do, and his phone accidentally, through a twists and turns and virtual reality machines, it accidentally sends him back in time to the year 1955. Wow, that is exciting. Yes. Now, the only problem is he has a cell phone and he's in 1955. Well, that's that's a problem in and of itself. Sure. But his, his main problem is, is the phone still works, so he's able to communicate back to the present to someone who's helping him. But he forgot to bring one thing back with him that he desperately needs. The charger. The charger. (laughs) So without the charger, the battery is slowly dying. And if that battery dies on his cell phone, he'll be trapped in the past forever. And so he's in a rapid race to try to figure out how to save enough power but also find a way back into the present. Well, that's exciting, and and uh, you know what? I'm going to uh, – we're not going to talk any more about this because I want you to come back as we get closer to the publication date to okay. talk – have a full episode talking uh, about that great book because it's definitely something I can absolutely uh, – well, I can relate to it myself being on the road and forgetting to take my character <laughs> with me. But I know a lot of kids can too because, uh, yeah, they're constantly – you know, they, they, they can't do anything without their phone, and they're constantly running out of power and trying to find a place to charge or, you know, borrow someone's charger. And uh, so, yeah, talk about a great uh, topical book that's right 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 in the forefront of lots of kids' minds. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, it's so funny. Like, whenever I bring it up and I ask the kids, I go, what do you think he forgot? They always nail it on the first try that it's the charger. <laughs> oh, it's like, it doesn't matter how old they are. They're six years old. They're like, you got to bring your charger. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it is definitely a problem out there. This is fantastic. Now, uh, I'm really excited. Tell us again where we can connect with you online to learn more about Monsters in Manhattan and all the other great things that Daniel Jude Miller is up to. It's real easy. It's There's two websites, but they're basically the same website. There's djudemiller.com, which is all the books are listed there, djudemiller.com. And also, if the if that one's too difficult to remember, the easier one is just monstersinmanhattan.com. If you go there, there's links to all the other books, and there's that map I spoke about, which is tons of fun, and it's free. So you can learn all about the monsters and all about the city I grew up in and all about the uh, upcoming books and when the new books will be released. We've had such a great time talking about beautiful Manhattan and the monsters that inhabit Manhattan and talking to the author of all that fun, Daniel Jude Miller. Daniel, thanks so much for being part of our show. Thanks for having me. Before we invite Faith Goldstein to join us from the Chicago Toy and Game Fair, I want to invite you to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. 
It's a whole lot of information out there. We have information about our live events. We met Faith out at the Chicago Touring Game Fair. We let you know that we're going back out to Chicago to the Kids Expo February 8th and 9th. We would love to come to your community to uh, let folks know what it's like to be a part of the Reading With Your Kids podcast and to amaze you all with some of my totally interactive magic. You can find out all about those live events. You can find out about the Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read program and check out my amazing producer, Fatima's blog, all at readingwithyourkids.com. Okay, we are here at the Chicago Toy and Game Fair, and sitting next to me is one of our friends, the author of Gorilla's Night Out, Faith Goldstein. Faith, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Chad? I am awesome. One of the neat things, you know, we live in this time of social media, and you meet people from around the world online and most of the time you, you never meet them in person but it's really cool when you do actually get a chance to meet one of your virtual friends in person like we're doing today yes it's so nice to finally put a name with the face and have a face-to-face conversation absolutely and thankfully she didn't get scared and run away when she saw this <laughs> face so remind us again what Gorilla's Night Out is all about. It's about four gorillas who escape from the Central Park Zoo one night in search of the ultimate night out. And their adventure brings them to different spots in the city where they get into a lot of mischief and monkey business and have a lot of fun. That's awesome. Now, what? We are talking earlier. There's a lot of monkey business people can get into here in Chicago. Why did you choose New York? as the place where the gorillas get out first and not your home city of Chicago. You know what? I've always loved New York, and if it weren't for my family living here, I would have lived in New York. So I thought that's just such a fun big city with so many different sights to see and so many different things that they could do. So really just because I'm a huge fan of New York, that's how it started. Excellent. And the great thing about being a children's author is that one book can turn into a series and you can bring the gorillas like around the world. Any thoughts about that? Absolutely, I would love to have them visiting different spots, especially my hometown, Chicago. Hopefully we'll have that in the future, as well as maybe LA and around the world, as you've said, the gorillas can go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. what a great way to teach kids about geography and countries and cultures. Absolutely. 100% correct. Yes. And and make sure the gorillas get to Boston. Oh, I love that. I'd love to check out a game. My son would love that because he is a huge fan of the Boston Red Sox. Good man. Good man. He has two teams here in Chicago, but he likes the Red Sox. I love that. Well, we've had such a great time speaking with the author of Gorilla's Night Out, Faith Goldstein. Faith, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks so much, Jed, for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading with the Kids podcast. Our guest will be the author of A Buck and a Puck and also Hawkeyes. Her name is Jennifer Ramirez. She'll be joining us from Burlington and Ontario. That's the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. You know, we let you know that at readingwithyourkids.com, you can find out about our live events and also about our author services. One of them that you may very well be interested in if you are an author is our Reading With Your Kids certified great read program. We have assembled a a team of, of educators, parents, and kids. And if they believe that your book is worthy of four or five out of five stars, It becomes a Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read. And with that status comes a whole lot of great promotional tools that will help your book stand out from the crowd of books that are published every single month. Check it all out today. Readingwithyourkids.com. I want to thank the folks t- today who made. T- but we want to let me try that again. Let me try that again. We want to thank the folks who made today's show so very wonderful. Of course, we want to thank our guests, Daniel Jude Miller. Be sure to check out Monsters in Manhattan. We also want to thank Faith Goldstein. Be sure to check out Gorillas Night Out. I want to thank my amazing producer, Fatima Khan, for all she does for the show. Don't miss her blog at readingwithyourkids.com. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to thank Augie the Doggy for having my back here in the studio. And most of all, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you find your podcasts. 
We also want to thank you most of all for, for making the world a better place. And you do that every time you choose to read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.